So first, I want to say thank you to all for joining us today. We're really happy that you're spending your morning, afternoon, or evening with us today for this memo writing workshop. Um, and we are going to get started. Um, so my name is Nicole Parker, and I'm currently the Director of U.S. Outreach for the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance, but I'm very happy to be with you all today for this wonderful international event that we are having. Um, this event was organized in partnership with the Global Young Academy, and it is meant to equip students, with policy fellows, and early career researchers with the skills needed to write effective policy memos addressing the topics related to trust in science. And this is in relation to the 2021 Global Young Academy Annual Conference. So before we dig into the memo writing, I do wanna provide a brief background on JSPG for those of you who may not be familiar with the journal. Um, so I'm going to place our website in the chat. One second. All right. So I just placed our website in the chat, you all should see it in a second. There we go. Um, so we are a internationally recognized open access peer reviewed publication. We cover every corner of science and technology and policy. Um, through the journal, we boast of research and writing credentials for early career scholars in science policy, and we encourage them to engage in policy discourse and debate. We publish op-eds, technology assessments, policy memos, and analyses, white papers, book reviews, workshop proceedings, and other research articles. We also promote the publications through our global mailing list and events such as workshops, webinars, and a podcast where we interview published authors. So you can also follow us on social media. We, JSPG is on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And we also have a YouTube channel where we do post all of our recordings. And so as you can see, we're recording this workshop and this will be posted as well. If you wanna follow us on those accounts to just keep in touch with what we're doing, um, I am going to post those websites in the chat. And I'm also going to post the link for you all to be able to sign up for our newsletter in which you can also um, stay up to date on all of our events. And so that should be in the chat now as well. Okay. So before we get started, are there any questions for me about JSPG that I can answer? If so, can you please just raise your hand and then, and, and then I will ask you to unmute yourself. Oh, we have a question in the chat. How does JS, so, okay. The question in the chat says, how does JSPG help with writing skills for early career researchers? So for example, this opportunity that we are having today, this memo, workshop writing workshop is an excellent um, way that JSPG offers to help with writing skills for early career researchers. We use this opportunity for you to develop the skills to create your own memo that you possibly could submit to the journal. Um, and in addition, we do work with a lot of partners and we um, have worked with, um, we've partnered with UC Irvine before in which you, uh, which you'll hear about a bit more later because we have some moderators that participate in this program. But we've partnered with UC Irvine and other organizations in the last year for a virtual policy and advocacy certificate for early career scientists. And so we are offering this opportunity again starting July 15th. And you can actually sign up on June 1st. And so you can sign up until June 1st. So the deadline is fastly approaching. So um, I suggest that you use this weekend to apply if you are interested in the opportunity. It's really a wonderful course. Um, and I've just placed the link for the application for that certificate program in the chat. In addition, like I mentioned earlier, um, we do post these workshops on YouTube and we also have a lot of other resources um, that are on our YouTube channel. And I will actually place the YouTube channel in the chat so you all can easily get to that page and subscribe. Any other questions from the? 
in the chat, Nico. Oh, I just see, I just saw it. Thank you, Felix. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm interested. Okay, so Agnes says she's interested in the journal. It, I'm interested if the journal has specific focus, health science or social or other. No, so the journal has a very wide focus on all science and technology topics as it relates to policy. So any ideas that you have related uh, to science policy are welcome. There's not a really narrow focus on just health or just tech. Um, so very, very broad and very open to all ideas and topics. Thank you for your question, Agnes. Let's see if I missed. Do you have step? Do you have established communication channels with policymakers? So we do have, um, you know, our journal has a, a great view uh, for the public. And then also we've been, um, a lot of our things have been shared in national press. And in addition, we have a governing board um, that is very much so in touch with channels of policymakers. I will say that we, uh, you know, we're nonpartisan. We are not uh, we do not lobby or anything of that nature, so we're not directly going on Capitol Hill with our memos, but we are making sure that we are doing the outreach to make sure that the memos that are written in our journal are elevated to a level in which we know that they are seen by policymakers. I hope that answers your question, Felix. Okay. All right, well, if there's no other questions, we can move into today's event. So um, as I mentioned before, if you are not speaking, please mute and turn off your video. Um, and in order to facilitate the breakout rooms, we do know that when you all registered, you did place your interest um, in which breakout room you would like to be in. But there were a lot of registered participants. So we are asking that in order to help us facilitate the breakout rooms, if you would please edit your Zoom name to put a one in front of your name if you are interested in the transforming food systems breakout groups. And please put a two, the number two in front of your name if you are interested in the breakout groups related to COVID-19. Um, and if you could do all that, if you could do that now while we are going to hear from a few more speakers, that would really help us facilitate the breakout process um, during that time. Um, in terms of what to expect for today, I'm going to place the agenda in the chat so you all know how the next couple of hours will go. Um, so that document there is uh, the agenda for today. Um, and after we have some opening remarks, we will have a presentation on memo writing and then practice working on policy memo outlines in the breakout rooms. And then we'll come back and we'll recap. Um, so feel free to continue to ask um, questions. And OK, I will repeat. So if you are, thank you, Adriana. That was very helpful. So put a one in front of your name for food systems and a two in front of your name for the COVID. Um, for the COVID group. Um, and, you know, as I was about to say, feel free to ask questions in the chat um, if you have them for our speakers. And you can also send them directly to me through a private chat if you have a question for our speakers. So now I would like to introduce Felix, um, who is a program specialist at the Regulatory Science Group, International Center for Genetic Engineering and by biotechnology of, is it Trist? Trist? Trist, Italy. Italy. Um, he is also a member of the GYA and co-lead of the Science Advice Working Group. He will give opening remarks and his talk is titled, Empowering Young Scientists with Scientific Advance, Advice Skills. Um, Felix, thank you so much for joining us today. And now I will turn it over to you to um, share your slides and start your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Nicole. Absolutely. I am super happy this afternoon, my afternoon, uh, seeing that this crazy idea that we have together that we have come together is uh, true. Finally, we have expanded this last 
maybe three, four months in, in the organization and, and planning this activity. And it is, I, I am super happy because of that. So thank you, Simon, uh, Nicole and Adriana for this opportunity and to bring this um, workshop uh, today with us, the Global Young Academy and our invited uh, participant, absolutely. So in the next few minutes, I would like to talk about the Global Young Academy briefly. So I'm going to share my screen because I have prepared uh, some slides. Okay, one moment, please. I'm still. Okay. Okay, let's do this. Okay, I, I don't find a button for activating the audio of my presentation because I have indeed a video there, so I, I, I don't. Okay, I don't see that, that I could show it to you, but let's try it anyway. So uh, my name is Felix Moronta and well, uh, I wanted to show you this object. This object is the Nebra Sky Disk. This is an object that, have, uh, that has thousands of years of living. It was discovered at the beginning of the 21th century and it is considered like one of the most important archaeology dis discovery in, in the last year. This is a metal disc and it's, it is a map of the sky that people, that former inhabitants of the central Germany used to know and to ubicate themselves in the space, in their territory with the help of the uh, astronomical objects like the moon, the Milky Way, the stars, and so on. It is a sky map. And I am telling you this because this object, it is uh, in this muse museum, in the Halle State Museum of Prehistory. I took this picture two years ago in the city of Germany at Halle. And I was here to just two years ago, because it is the same city where the German National Academy of Science, Leopoldina, is based. And uh, I was so, so, so lucky because during this time I was there to receive my membership of the Global Young Academy. And this academy, this academy groups near of 200 members from, from dozens of different countries around the world. And the people, the members are within the first 10 years, more or less after they PhD, sorry. And well, what the selection committee asks, it is the scientific excellence and the social commitment of the members. And we are all scientists from natural and social sciences. And mm, the Global Young Academy gives voice to young scientists around the world. We develop, connect, and mobilize young talent from six continents. And we empower young researchers to lead international, interdisciplinary, and intergenerational dialogue with the goal to make global decision making evidence informed and inclusive. Within the GYA, we have a number of working groups that work uh, towards a uh, determined goal. And, but I, I will focus on the science advice working group. Here I am with my former uh, colleague, uh, colleague, Alison Flynn and with Pinyan that is today among us, the other colleague of this working group. 
And in this working group, well, we, uh, it is aiming to attain a deeper level of understanding of science advice and the involvement by stakeholders. We build capacity in science advice and we organize concrete actions and building a community of young scientists and decision makers around this topic. And because of that, I am sure that you all know uh, the common interests between this working group and the Journal for Science Policy and Governance. And we are here today joining our uh, efforts toward the same goal. And well, what I told you this about the Nebra Sky Disc, because I consider that the Global Young Academy is a sort of compass, like a map that are providing us guidance of, of how or where to go uh, to reach um, a better place to live. And it's, it, it, I like the comparison with the former map, the sky of the uh, former habitat of that, uh, uh, of that part of the world, let's say. And this is something that, uh, that I joined with my, my uh, six word history that I uh, told uh, during that time. But well, I, I will give you the link to this video in the chat because it wouldn't work now here, I'm sorry. And that's it. And that's it here. Uh, well, everybody have my, my contact details no? on Twitter and my email account. And please contact me, uh, whatever you want. I will be happy to respond very few questions if you have it. Thank you so much, Felix. Does anyone have any questions for Felix? I know I have one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one question that I do have, you all have your conference coming up. So what do you think is the most important uh, thing for the public to actually put their trust in scientists? Like what should scientists be doing to ensure that? Yeah, uh, this is a, a, a extreme, extremely timely uh, conversations because the current crisis from the, in the last year has eroded so much the trust in science in many fields on one part and on the other hand, uh, it would be the opposite. Uh, it has been the opposite, I mean, for the science, it, it, would, it is, um, has been strengthened on the trust in scientists. But we have, we have the, the, these two parts. And because of that, we have uh, come together with our annual conference that it will be the next week. Everybody is invited to join uh, with the theme of Trust in Science. So um, in, during, that co during this next conference, we are going to talk and discuss different ways of how to maintain and even increase the trust uh, in scientists. No? All, all because it was something important is that scientists doesn't know everything. And it is important to, um, to make clear that a lot of uncertainties uh, are in place. And we have, we are full of uncertainties, absolutely. And, but, this is important to, to have it in mind, to communicate it in the, in the right way, and also to know how to communicate the risk, pandemic risks of other future or current risk. Um, so this is a, a, a ever always um, topic that it is needed to continue in the discussions and, and so on. So th thank you for your question, Nicole. And there's actually another question in the chat. Um, Aman says, what is the criteria to join your group, the Global Young Academy? Okay, uh, the Global Young Academy, 
uh, open a call for new members every year in September, around September, between August and September. And um, the young scientists should demonstrate their impacts on, um, on the uh, academia, but also the social commitment. They, they need to demonstrate that they have a track of activities that have impacting positively the society. And well, for demonstrating this kind of thing, where the, the, we have designed a, a questions, you know, particular questions and questionnaires that would um, will help us to get all this information. Are there any other questions for Felix from the participants? Let's see. Um, the question says, Dami Lola says, can anyone in need of mentorship send you an email? <laughs> I, uh, of course, I, I would be happy to read. And if, if I could help someone in whatever topic that I could uh, uh, say something or have an, uh, an opinion, I would be happy to hear it and respond. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Otherwise, I could connect these people with. Uh, yes. With, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I think a lot of the, uh, the moderators here today would definitely be willing to, to provide words of advice um, and, and provide some insight for all of you today. So um, thank you for your question. Okay, I believe, yes, I believe those are all of the questions. Um, so thank you so much, Felix, for your words. Um, and now we are going to move into the next part of the program in which we will hear from Dr. Doyen Adubanjo, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, who will be talking about us writing policy memos. So Dr. Adubanjo is the Executive Secretary at the Nigerian Academy of Science. He's the Chair of the Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria and Chairman Africa Chapter International Network for Government Science Advice. Dr. Adubanjo, thank you so much for being here today and we are looking forward to your presentation. Um, and I am going to allow you to start sharing your slides. Thank you very much, Nicole. And um, quite a privilege to be here with everyone. I hope the slides are pretty clear and I'm loud and clear enough, I hope. All right. Okay, Everything so quite a privilege. Be. Sorry? No, I was gonna say everything should be good now. I was just was making sure your slides could be seen. All right, great, thank you. Um, so basically, yes, as Nicole said, I think I did forget to send the bio, but um, pardon me. I'm Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Academy of Science, which, uh, like its counterparts around the world, is the peak independent scientific body in Nigeria and um, has two primary functions. One is the promotion of the development of science itself as a whole. And uh, the second one is actually to provide science advice to government and other stakeholders, thereby improving uh, the quality of life of Nigerians primarily, uh, but of course, through networking and uh, its partnership with other institutions globally, uh, we can do that on the African continent and even globally. Uh, we release joint statements with several bodies across the board. Uh, so also I chair the International Network for Government Science Advice Africa chapter, uh, which is the first chapter of INSA to exist. INSA is a global body um, that is charged with or primarily focused on developing capacity for what is known as science advice, which I'll say quite a bit about today. Um, and I chair the Africa chapter of that. Um, as for the Association of Public Health, Physicians of Nigeria that Nicole mentioned, I, I used to chair the Lagos uh, chapter of that, uh, so I'm no longer chair of that one. Thank you. So here we go. I think um, basically it's important before we were talking about writing science memos. And um, well, first I should also say before I forget, uh, thanks to 
the science advice working group of the GYA, you know, for the invitation, and of course, uh, GSPG, uh, particularly thanks to Binyam and Felix. And I know I've been a, a bit, uh, maybe a handful in the last few days, but it's okay. So, um, so science advice, I think we need to generally uh, have a grip on that uh, because writing science memos is within that context. We need to understand it within the context of science advice itself. And uh, science advice is the process structures and institutions uh, through which governments and politicians consider science, technology, or innovation uh, in policy and decision making. So basically, it's about how you infuse um, science and scientific evidence uh, into policy making. Or usually, when I talk of institutions like the academy, I call them uh, bridge institutions that try to get the evidence into the real world. You know, and uh, so when you talk about science advice. Primarily, you are looking at things like uh, science for policy, uh, which is the how do you get that science into policy making? Um, but also, we can talk about policy for science, which is there are also policies that are made uh, for science, that is for the development of science. So, for science for policy, uh, you'll be looking at all of those um, issues. I think in recent times, all of us have been dealing with lots of policies, uh, whether we like them or not. Uh, about COVID-19, and there are, there are many debates all, all over the world about the um, necessity or otherwise, the accuracy or otherwise, appropriateness or otherwise, legality or otherwise of um, many of the policies that we have been, I mean, that, that have been enacted, uh, you know, because of COVID-19 around the world. And uh, for policy for science is when you are trying to look at why do we get more funding to research, what policy do we make and all of that. Okay, so basically, you are looking at how you link policy and science, and uh, that's like two gears, you know. So for maybe someone like Felix in Trieste, uh, um, this this is more appropriate. So you you are looking at two gears, and if you have two gears like this, uh, how you make them actually drive a system, or drive or, or cause motion and all that uh, requires a gear system, you know, you know, to ensure that all these. Um, uh, the, these teeth can, you know, match appropriately, and that that system that matches them is uh, the science advice mechanism. So that's the gear system you get in the in the car. It enables these uh, spinning wheels, in quote, you know, to be able to work appropriately with each other, and that's the world of the of the policy and of the science. However, so that that complexity, whatever it takes to make that work, is the science advice mechanism. Uh, but again, we know that. You know, if you have those two, if you have those two gears uh, rubbing against each other, things can be a little rough. Uh, so what makes that smooth is that you have to have oil, and the oil of that system is um, something that Felix mentioned, and I think I, I was happy to hear the GYA is talking about that next week, and that is trust. You know, how do you build trust? You know, if you 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 have to build trust to ensure that these things can run uh, pretty smoothly and several. Thing. So I'm making my input into the GYA um, com conference already. You know, you build trust by integrity, transparency, uh, you know, things like that. So uh, we'll talk about the science policy gap a little bit. And in, in, in doing that, we have to realize that the, there are differences, you know, between the world of the scientist uh, and the world of the policymaker. Uh, that's why, again, ordinarily you will say, well, if, I'm, if you're talking about writing science uh, policy memos, it's just about writing. I'm a good writer. Uh, but that's why you have um, certain uh, technicalities to it, because you, you, there are differences between these two groups. Uh, and you must be aware that they are different. Uh, you must be aware of some of their differences. Uh, and all of that will, will go into informing how you write documents that are meant for uh, policy. So science and, and, and policy making have distinct cultures, uh, methods, philosophies. They, they think differently completely. Uh, and the, this interaction that you have between them uh, is influenced by different things, whether culture, whether history, and sometimes the relationship between them in that society or between even the science and the society. Uh, and I, I think, you know, just placing this on the table right here, um, I think the COVID-19 experience is, is um, a perfect case study that reflects on several aspects of science advice that I think a lot of people would do well to take note of. 
uh, it will still have to study many things about how things were done and all of that for many years to come, you know, and I think it's going to help us. So uh, it's, it's a complex interaction, really. And the place of societal values is different, um, science and, and, and policy making. So how you, I mean, the, the, the idea is that at, as at now, of course, because of these complexities or differences, uh, there's increasing recognition of the fact that you need uh, boundary structures or institutions that can help to bridge this. You know, uh, you need to find a way to bridge this gap between them. And that's why all of these things are evolving. It, it, this is a fast evolving field, you know, science advice. Uh, and it's a fast evolving important field. So talking about policymakers and what, what, I mean, who they are, what they stand for, philosophy, culture, uh, we have to realize that they have um, often very limited flexibility, you know, so they, they, there are certain constraints, you know, that they have to, uh, that hold them to certain positions. Uh, again, often they have to just jump at the problem. Um, well, if we feel, you know, maybe scientists those on the science side will think, well, uh, they are too much in a hurry, they just want the answers now. We particularly deal with that at the academies globally, actually, uh, where, again, based on context, it's different. I, I, I do some work with the U.S. National Academies, and uh, in the U.S. Academies, we can, I mean, questions are posed by government. Um, they put up proposals to, to deal with that question and provide the government with answers in two years and uh, uh, through a process of a consensus study. And um, very often, you know, we tell them that cannot work in Africa. No government, no government official is going to wait for you for two years to answer his questions. They are not interested. Uh, and so we do things a little differently here. You know, but everywhere, very often we feel that the policymakers are too quick. They, they, they don't have enough patience, uh, but actually also the public don't have enough patience to wait for the policymaker to deal with a number of issues that, that they have to deal with, okay? Um, so the policy cycle is, is generally short, getting shorter. Um, and then when you look at it, many of the relevant science is incomplete, a lot is ambiguous. Um, there, there are many issues. Again, I'll refer you to COVID-19, and if you just cast your mind around the number of issues and uh, how science is trying to answer uh, many of the questions that are coming. Uh, in fact, sometimes I felt that the scientists have been too bold uh, to answer certain questions where, where there should have been a bit more honesty to say, well, uh, we believe it is, you know, but um, it's not a hundred percent certainty. So. Um, but then you, you also look at it, the policymaker uh, oftentimes, uh, they, they can't be expected to understand everything, you know, so even if you have somebody who is from a particular field, like I can say in 2014, uh, in 2014, for instance, we're dealing with the Ebola outbreak in uh, parts of West Africa, including Nigeria. And um, I do remember particularly an encounter with the Minister of Health, where we, you know, we were telling him he was trying to deal with the issues and had made one or two statements. Uh, oh. Uh, please, da Damiola, could you uh, mute your microphone, please? Damiola, thank you. Okay, so they don't they don't get everything, you know. And um, so this, the policymaker will know everything. So I was talking about 2014 with the Minister of Health, and uh, we're trying to explain to him, you know, we were trying to show him that what what he had said on TV and all that was wrong. And uh, I, I like this, his own honesty and how he sat down with us that night and said, you know, uh, he's a professor of uh, orthopedic surgery. And the man said, you, you know what, just explain this thing to me. Assume I'm a dummy, uh, you know, so don't think of me as a professor of medicine. Uh, take me as a dummy and break this down to me. What exactly 
am I supposed to do? What was wrong and all of that? And, I, I, and that's the point, you know, the fact that you think, oh, this is someone in medicine, he knows everything, no. Um, so much more, more so if he wasn't even one, if he wasn't a physician or anything, uh, it, it's even more complex. And that's the situation many policymakers are in. Uh, we can't expect them to understand everything. So there's a need for translation and brokerage, you know, of knowledge. And uh, they also see scientific evidence as just one of a number of inputs. Uh, for the scientists, very good. They're very good at problem definition, um, but less so at uh, workable, scalable, or meaningful solutions. Uh, they often come with a lot of pride, you know, like we know it, and the politicians are dumb, and the you know, decision makers are not smart. They can't understand anything. Uh, but again, they fail to understand that there are multiple things that go into policy formulation. Um, but they have a critical role in the policy process uh, itself. Okay, so uh, overall policy is uh, not only determined by the scientific evidence, uh, but should be informed by it. And uh, the inputs into policy are diverse, you know, public opinion, uh, the electoral contracts, very real. Uh, fiscal objectives and obligations. So one, one of the things, for instance, with COVID-19, uh, I do remember at the start of last year, uh, March last year, I was uh, in debates with colleagues in the public health physicians group, and we're debating you know, the closure of borders, whether Nigeria needed to do that or it was uh, too slow or not and all that. And I told them, look, uh, you need to consider multiple things when you want to take that decision. Uh, one of them are the fiscal objectives and obligations, the financial implications uh, as an economy, you know, and you don't just jump at it. And they were like, look, it's only, only people who are alive uh, that can talk about finances and economy. Uh, so I did tell them then, I said, okay, I'll see what you tell me a few months down the line when the government is struggling to even pay salaries. Uh, unfortunately, we're at that point, And uh, many, I'm sure many of them will remember uh, you know, what I said then, and I told them, I said, you have been narrow-minded because you are only concerned about health, which is your field of expertise. However, that policymaker has to think about many more things than well, what you are talking about. So, okay, so taking all that in, in, into consideration, uh, we now look at it and say, how do we write good science policy memos? Uh, first, we know that the policy memo is, a, is simply a document uh, which aims to provide adequate analysis uh, of an issue, uh, possibly with recommendations for dealing with it. You know, and of course, if it's a science, science policy memo, you're talking about uh, this, a, this scientific issue or one that science uh, may offer solutions in resolving. And uh, there are things you have to consider, you know, when you are thinking about that, uh, again, taking a number of the things that I've said into uh, consideration now, you have to think about the memo you want to write, understand your audience context and timeline. Um, at the start of, you know, about the middle of last year, we had to, for instance, with a number of academies, uh, about three other academies in West Africa, we were looking at, uh, we, we had a charge from what is known as the Network of African Science Academies uh, to do a rapid consensus study and come up with a policy brief on, um, science advice in health emergencies. In emergencies was where we started from, uh, but then by the time our, our committee had a meeting, the first meeting, uh, we realized that given the timeline we needed to meet, uh, talking about emergencies as a whole was too big for us to deal with, um, and we had to narrow things down. So you have to understand your audience context and timeline. We narrowed down to health emergencies strictly, uh, and we were then able to deal with the uh, issue. So again, you look at it, the question and answer aligned. Um, do you understand what the demand, which is the policy side, wants? Um, and then do you, does the policy side also clearly understand what the policymaker wants? You know, are we clear? But I mean, you you have to understand some of these things. Uh, look at the systems analysis, policy options, and solution. Uh, again, you have to consider. You know, is this you just brokering knowledge or this is you advocating for a position? You know, what exactly are you trying to achieve? And um, you have to, I mean, consider a balanced multidimensional evidence synthesis. 
uh, do a good stakeholder analysis who are the key stakeholders you are dealing with and perhaps addressing your uh, memo too. And um, you, you consider the clarity of the question, uh, the language, what are the conclusions you will be driving at, and then you consider other dimensions of policy input. And then given all of that, you look at how do you want to present it? So what format does that take? You know, and a policy memo can take uh, many formats, you know, and how would you present what you're saying? So whether that be it's a report you want to put up, be it policy brief, op-eds, uh, position papers, or just a simple direct memo for a policy maker or a decision maker. Uh, just as a quick case study, I think 2012, the Nigerian Academy of Science was asked to uh, accredit, as it were, basically assess uh, the agencies under the Federal Ministry of Science and Technology and advise the ministry about those agencies. They were their, their institutions set up for specific purposes. Uh, uh, raw materials research, for instance, uh, there's a space agency. So uh, don't assess all of them and advise the government you know, on their effectiveness, efficiencies, how to strengthen them. Uh, and we came up with a report you know, you know, to do that. Uh, so I'll, I'll say also then um, that what makes an effective policy memo? How would you achieve that? Uh, you have to begin by thinking of the end from the very beginning. So oftentimes, for instance, we some of the things that lead to the input of a memo could include a workshop. And I would tell staff, I tell our staff, you need to decide uh, what's going to be the output of that event. You know, is it going to be a report? Is it going to be a policy brief? Do we want to just produce a communicate? Uh, it's when we think of what we want to get out of it, and we have to think about it even before we start. It helps us to know the kind of uh, evidence, the kind of input uh, that we need for that document, because we've, we've determined everything, including, like I put there, number two, uh, the right size of a document. Because you say, well, a memo is a short document, but what exactly is short? So I, I decide then not to go with the number of pages, uh, but you have to ask that question, what would be the right size of a document? You know, is it going to be a two pager? Is it going to be four pager, eight pages, 20 pages? What is the right size of a document in this particular instance uh, that will give the right, right amount of information, uh, not too much and not too little? You know, so if you, if you give too little also, it's easy to discard the document and say it contains nothing. Uh, if it's too much also, uh, all of the key facts and recommendations in there might be lost. So uh, number three, you talk about, you, you have to think about or look at uh, how attractive the document is. And uh, it's not enough you know, to have all of the information necessary. It's not enough to have all the evidence. It's not enough to have done a good analysis and all of that. It's important to ensure the document is attractive. Uh, there are too many good books or documents that are not read because they just don't look good to the eyes. And, and so we have to pay attention to everything from cover design to formatting, uh, subheadings, headings, and all of that. You, everything must be looked at critically uh, because it's when it looks attractive at first glance, it improves the chances of it being read at all and therefore it becomes effective. Uh, number four, make uh, the important points obvious. So for, so for the policy memos, you'll be looking at how to shoot out your recommendations uh, and things first, you know, unlike what you do with um, a scientific paper ordinarily, where you follow the process, introduction, methodology, and all that, and go down to recommendations and conclusions at the end. Uh, you have to ask a question, how do I make those things that are the, the, the key uh, deliverables, how do I make it obvious uh, at the very beginning of it? So if you have a report, for instance, which you would then consider to be a slightly bulky document, or maybe only very bulky document, then you want to have an executive summary uh, that captures everything at the very beginning of it, or that can even be produced as a separate document of that report and can be shared separately uh, from that report. Um, we, sorry. 
And you, like I said, you also can put in, you can use text boxes to highlight some of those things uh, on the side, on the front page and all of that. Uh, and put in all the recommendations. So if all that the policymaker uh, wants to read or has the time to read at those recommendations, you can see them right away. Uh, and then if he has more time, wants more explanation, he can read the whole document. Uh, again, number five, provide adequate, adequate background information. So try as much as possible. There's a tendency uh, when we write or speak to assume that people know what we're saying. So you have to try to provide enough background to issues, uh, just enough, you know, and not assume that the people reading know what you mean or have an understanding of that field already. So when you use a term, sometimes, for instance, uh, perhaps for accuracy, and this links to the next point, which is using simple language. Um, when you use a, a term, or if you, if, if you must use a term, a technical term, uh, then you want to explain where necessary, knowing that uh, it's not everybody who is reading or who will be reading uh, will, will be initiated into your own exclu exclusive expertise group. Um, so use simple language, the so next one. Uh, but then maintain scientific accuracy. One of the things we tend to do when we produce our reports at the Nigerian Academy of Science uh, is that we do reviews. Review is my last point that down there. Uh, but in doing the reviews, we uh, select reviewers who are not just experts or know about what we've written about. Uh, but we pick reviewers sometimes who, who know nothing about it. It's not their field at all. And uh, it's deliberate. And what we want to achieve is to see if that reviewer understands what was written. Uh, and I've had instances where somebody would flag something and I have people arguing and saying, no, but that statement is correct. So I say to them, yes, it is correct, I agree. Uh, however, this person has flagged it, meaning that there are a number of people out there who eventually get this document who might also not understand it. It might sound ambiguous to them. Uh, so the question we need to ask ourselves right now is can we rephrase that statement, you know, without losing the meaning, can we just rephrase it in a in what we will not agree will be a clearer manner, you know, or, or simpler language, and then we'll try to achieve that. So again, uh, next point: use an appropriate writing style. So again, if we're dealing with reports, for instance, we ask ourselves: do we want to report every presentation uh, clearly as an individual pre presentation, or we want to match everything uh, into a prose? kind of uh, write-up without separating uh, individual presentations. So that, for instance, is determining uh, the appropriate writing style for the particular document. Then they say, a, um, I mean, a picture is worth a thousand words, so consider uh, visuals in, in places first. The overall attractiveness of the document gets improved with, if used right, uh, and then you also can make uh, or get, get across strong messages when you use the appropriate visuals. Uh, it's not also just enough to put in graphs. Some of the graphs are worse than words. And you might, uh, so sometimes you are better off without the graphs. I've seen some graphs in documents that are just really terrible. Um, so, but then consider using the visuals, the right visuals. Uh, provide evidence. I put there, uh, there is a debate of as to what constitutes evidence. So you need to also know what would be uh, appropriate evidence in this instance. And, um, and then ensure that you, in, in that document, you have been able to address uh, the things that, you know, everybody will be thinking about what is for this, what is against this. Uh, try to ensure that the document will show, if properly read, that you had considered the, the, the pros and cons in there. Uh, you, you may be advocating a particular position, uh, but show that you have considered the alternative, you know, and then I put in the review um, internally and externally. Uh, we, we also consider that to be critical for our documents. So again, examples, we have uh, two reports. I didn't get a good picture of them, unfortunately, but on the left is uh, science, the science advisory landscape in Africa, uh, which was um, the INSA Africa uh, working with the Nigerian Academy of Science on a consensus study. When we produced this last year, uh, was re released in the early part of last year. Uh, but by December, I was in a meeting in Science Forum South Africa, 
and it was a delight to hear one of the commissioners of the African Union making reference to the content, actually quoting from the, 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 the document. So you want the, the, your documents, your memos to be that effective. So it's reached the highest level of policymaking in Africa uh, in a few months. And on the right, we have one in uh, Women in Science and Nigeria's Development, another example. And again, I have uh, another example, the, the policy brief on climate change in Africa, which was released at the eight annual meeting of African Science Academies developed by several African academies then at the annual meeting in 2012. You know, uh, in fact, by the time this was also released, we, we had, um, it was featured, I think it was the New York Times or something by the next day, it was there. Um, so thank you very much. I hope I've been able to touch on some of the, uh, some useful points. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, we have a few questions in the chat. So uh, Dr. Odubandro, if you could stop sharing your slides, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one second. And... Okay, all right, great. So the first question we have um, says, does policy memo outlines, do policy memo outlines include methods and materials used to generate evidence? Well, it depends on the kind of, um, um, what's it called, on the kind of document it is. And that's the kind of output you are writing on. You know, so if you are writing on, yes, some research done and all that, you will include all of those things because they validate uh, the, the memo altogether you know, you, you report it on that, but how you report it is different from how you report it in a scientific journal. Mm -hmm. um, and another question, um, this is more so specific um, to, you know, one of the topics that we're gonna talk about in the breakout room, but can you um, describe some unique challenges that Nigeria has faced during COVID-19 and, and how has the academies helped kind of tackle some of these challenges? Well, one was um, actually, the, I was making some uh, build reference to that, the, the issue of, you know, closing the borders and actually having a lockdown. And at that start, you know, there was, there was quite some reluctance. First, the academy has people serving on all the policymaking bodies around this. Uh, so there's a ministerial expert advisory committee uh, on COVID-19 that's chaired by a past president of the academy, you know, so working with the academy actually uh, the policy memo, we worked on that together. The first, uh, we did a, a public statement advising government, you know, in fact, it was time to, time to shut down, you know, and at that point, it, it was like everybody was still being reserved and the academy's position was no, you need a national lockdown at the moment because you've lost control of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be total, it needs to be led by the federal government or the states, and it needs to be brief. However, in that period, we also need to strategize on certain things and answer certain questions, getting ready for reopening. You know, so that was a, a I mean, a start. Uh, we worked with the prime research funding agency uh, to start, you know, funding research uh, on COVID-19 to answer certain critical questions, you know, for Nigeria. And um, as of now, we, we they, gave, they gave out eventually uh, just six special grants. They did do a call, a bigger call for, for people to put in. But at that point, people were head on research teams were head on and charged to do research on certain things. And the academy was asked to oversee those, that the, the research they're doing and ensure that the output gets into policy. So we're on that even now. So th those are just examples, so I don't talk too much. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions coming in the chat really related to the structuring of how to write a memo. So one question is, what kind of references, references do you recommend to cite when um, people do write their policy memo? Well, I, I recommend the same, the same references a researcher would cite first and foremost, because some of your biggest critics will be 
uh, people with strong academic backgrounds who immediately criticize and say, no, that's not what reference do they have, you know, and all of that. However, uh, don't just totally dismiss, you know, reports from organizations, think tanks and all that. They are also valid references. You know, some academics will say, no, it's not in a peer reviewed journal and this and that, but sometimes uh, you need to consider them, you know, as references also for some of the things that you, you have to put up. So it can be varied, but I'll say yes, use the agreed references, uh, the peer reviewed published papers and all that. That is great, uh, but don't throw away all the others, you know, and say that's the only thing that is possible. And another question related to writing. Um, so, you know, as we're constructing an academic paper, usually there's the introduction, methods, materials, things of that nature. What approach would you take to writing your memo? Would it be kind of, do you want to put the bottom line up front? Like, would you lead with your conclusion and then kind of follow up with the background? What's your perspective on how memo should be structured to be most impactful? Well, it, it also depends on what uh, what kind of memo you know I'm, I'm dealing with and what particular topic also. I, I think what scientists need to deal with, I, I like dealing with science communication a lot. And I think what scientists need to deal with is to, is to step away from being a, a negative, you know, and just think about how do I get this person's attention? Mm -hmm. You know, how can I get the attention to, the most, most important details in what I've written. And if we think, the, I, I, I think that's the way a journalist thinks, you know, so if we think that way, then we can play around with a number of uh, options. That's why I said you could put the recommendations at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you could use a text box at the side, even though you are, you are following a format of introduction or background, this, that, or you put a text box beside it that says recommendations or what we should do now. You know, and then they, they can read that straight away because that's catchy. Uh, yeah. Even though you still follow the traditional in quote way of writing stuff, you know. So we just have to you have to think and play around, and you you don't have to be regimented. So you, you can vary it at different times. I've seen a report that at the start of every chapter, they first they just had the recommendations first, um, and I, and then and that's what they did all through. While for another one, what they did was just to put up. The recommendations at the beginning as an executive summary. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, another question is this is kind of related back to the question I asked related to uh, COVID 19 a bit, but how has the Nigerian government followed the recommend or, or ha have they followed the recommendations from the Nigerian Academy of Science? Well, I can tell you, and I think that's what most uh, scientists will say globally that um, it's, it's not, um, well, maybe, maybe, maybe less than 50%. You know, you can't say uh, what you said is what they did, but like I was trying to point out, they also have many other considerations. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to a member of the Ministerial Expert Advisory Committee after one of their meetings, and she said, you know, who is actually, she's the current president of the academy. And she said, you know, it's, it's frustrating that uh, we just heard the minister asking us a question now. And we said, we told you about this weeks ago. We wrote it down in a memo to you and all that. And now you're asking us, what should you do about this? You know, and it shows that you didn't even really think about what we told you when we did. <laughs> you know, so you'll have to do that. And sometimes you have to repeat yourself uh, and again, find opportunities to put it in again and again and again and again. Uh, but the truth is that because of, of the complexity, and I think, uh, just like this one, this is not just a health, pan a health pandemic, it's a financial pandemic, it's uh, a social pandemic, it's, uh, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a complex problem, and they will be thinking about all of those things, you know, and not just perhaps what you are thinking about. Um, so it's, it, it, they've not followed, they've followed, you know, to uh, some extent, but again, you will find many areas where you'll be disappointed, let me put it that way. Yeah, I think uh, I think you can definitely relate. <laughs> um, that's common everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, another question from the chat is, what do what advice do you have for scientists to start getting involved with working with policy? Uh, first, drop the pride. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
you know, my simplest way of looking at it, I hear scientists talk a lot about how dumb the politician is. Uh, but the way I like to think about it is that if he's so dumb, but he keeps getting us to vote for him, um, then maybe it's not as dumb as we think he is. <laughs> at least he knows something. So um, you, you just have to drop the pride and, and realize that your expertise is different and um, you have to find how to communicate. Number two, you have to develop uh, the soft skills, you know, being friendly, uh, being patient, uh, and all of that. You, you can't afford to not have those things. Those are the things that eventually will build trust. You, you are not condescending, you know, you, you really accommodate them. You, yeah, and then eventually, once you, you put in a lot also into building personal relationships, uh, it goes a long way you know to to helping and then you always have to let them know that you're not there to run them down you're there to help you know you, you're there to make the work better we did put up a statement some four or five years ago on immunization uh, mm -hmm. in nigeria and the head of immunization agency called the moment it was published in the paper to call and said look why do you do this you know what are you trying to do blah 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 and then we had to tell him hey sir don't relax all we wrote is that they need to release funding uh, for vaccines. So what we're doing is helping you. Uh, you can say it in public because you'll be running down the government, uh, but we can say it. So now that we've said it, uh, you should expect something to happen. And indeed money was released. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to reassure them that you are on their side. Well, this was great. And there were many more questions really around the, the technical aspects of writing a memo. But to ensure that we have enough time for these breakout groups, we're going to end the Q&A here. Um, and we're really grateful for you being able to come today and provide this presentation, this excellent advice. So thank you again. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Nicole. It's my pleasure. Well, thank you. All right. So that was a great presentation. And I hope everyone is really, really excited about moving into our breakout rooms. Um, at this time, I know first drop the pride, I'm going to have to like put that on my Twitter account. Um, that was a really, really great quote and takeaway um, from that Q&A session. Thank you, Felix, for dropping that in the chat. Um, but I would like to take the time to introduce our moderators that are going to help guide the discussions within your breakout rooms um, for around the specific topics within the theme of this issue. So for this workshop, there are two topics and there are four, about four different moderators for each topic. Um, so these are all areas related to the GYA conference theme on trust in science. And for the first topic, we have transforming food systems. Um, public trust and engagement to reach the UN SDGs. And then for that, we have the um, following moderators. And moderators, if you could, you are, uh, please turn on your videos. I am going to spotlight you all um, so people can put a name with the face. Um, so the first uh, moderator that I'm going to introduce is. Uh, Tolua Oni. Um, and so Tolua is an urban epidemiologist at the Medical Research Council Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge. Um, she is a Next Einstein Forum Fellow and World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. Um, and additionally, she is a GYA member. So thank you for joining us today and volunteering to moderate a session. Um, the next moderator needs no introduction because you've already met him. Um, it is Felix. Uh, Felix, I just pinned you, so you can turn your video on if you want as well. Um, then the next moderator that we have, um, which will also be working in the food systems group, is um, Suchi. Um, and please correct me when I am pronouncing names. Um, I have no pride in that area. Um, and she is a neuro rehabilitation professional at Christian, Christian Medical College in Valor, India, 
where she currently works with persons with neurological disability. Um, she has been an author for the JSPG UN MGCY Joint Special Issue on the impacts of emerging technologies and wrote about the existing divide and accessibility to assistive technologies in the developing versus the developed world. So um, has lots of expertise in certainly um, learning and certainly drafting a memo for JSPG. So should be an excellent resource as we go to these breakout rooms. The final moderator that we have uh, in the food systems group is Dr. Mohammed Fassim. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, and he has a PhD in bioengineering and currently working as a lecturer at Biomedical School University of Otago, New Zealand. He has been working with a number of young scientist organizations for science policy and, diploma and diplomacy. Um, last year, he completed the science policy and advocacy for STEM scientists course from UC Irvine's GPS STEM program and a science diplomacy certificate. So that is the program that we uh, discussed earlier in the, in the session. And so we do hope that you all take advantage of that wonderful program. Um, and these are the moderators for our um, first group. Um, so then I will go ahead and introduce the moderators for the next group. Um, give me one second doing a lot of different things right now. <laughs> um, okay, um, so the next session we have will be focused on science policy advice, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and for the first person that we have leading a session from that is Marcus Krush. And Marcus is a historian and political scientist. Um, he uh, is a principal administrator at the European Parliament, responsible for culture and educational policies and associate professor at Heidelberg University. He is also a GYA member as well. Um, our next uh, moderator is Jasmine Benjamin. Um, Jasmine is a current PhD student um, in the biomedical sciences at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she researches feeding associated mechanisms of blood pressure control. She's extremely interested in science policy, so this is a good chance for a lot of people to uh, get some insight from her on how to um, go from you know, being a scientist to getting some interest in science policy. Um, as it pertains to healthcare and education. So thank you, Jasmine, for joining us as a moderator today. Um, our next moderator um, is Farah. And Farah, I am not even going to try to pronounce your last name because uh, my apologies. Um, and uh, she has her PhD in biology, neuroscience, and is a former assistant professor in physiology um, a UNESCO L'Oreal International Fellow for Women in Science, and she is a new GYA member, so certainly can provide some insight on how to become a member if you are interested. Um, she's very interested in science policy and diplomacy, diplomacy, and she is working as a project manager at the University of Paris and, the, and at the University of Tunis. So thank you for joining us, Vera. Um, and our last moderator for the COVID-19 group is um, Pradeep Kumar, who is currently, um, who's also a GYA member um, and is currently an associate professor of pharmaceutics in the Department of Pharmacy and Pharmacology at Wits University in Johannesburg, South Africa. So thank you all for joining us. Um, the breakout rooms will last for about 45 minutes in which we will discuss a series of questions as a group can kind of work together to craft an outline for your policy memo. At the same time, this is just a thought exercise with folks who can guide you through to think about the policies and these topics that are up for discussion. Um, all the moderators do have Google Docs that they will work in and we'll provide the link in the chat to those documents. 
um, so the moderators can have access to them. I'm going to place that in the chat now for the moderators. Um, um, and uh, as I said, uh, when we return from our breakout groups, the moderators will report back to all of us. And since we do have several moderators today, we're asking that we just have one main takeaway from your group um, to share with the whole entire group. Um, and so please remember moderators to take notes so our reviewers tomorrow can have something to review um, for part two of this discussion. Um, and so right before the breakout rooms end, I will send a one minute warning to everyone. Um, and if there's any questions, you can always come back to the main room um, to ask them. So before we send everyone away, are there any questions? I'm gonna monitor the chat for a second to see. I don't think so. Okay, all right. Well, everyone just give me a couple of seconds and I will get everyone off to their rooms. Yes. You all should be invited and can go into your rooms now. Oh, that's really good to hear. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 very common to not get through all of the uh, all of the outline, but we're, we're really excited that you all had a robust discussion and were able to contribute to the Google Docs um, and um, looking forward to hearing about your takeaways. So I'm gonna take a second to um, pin all of the moderators. Um, and then I would ask that if able for all the moderators to please turn your video on um, as we begin to report out. Um, make sure I cannot we... start my video because the host has stopped it. Thank you so much. That's so fantastic. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Did you, did you finish to, uh, Tolu? Oh yeah, we've solved all the, we've transformed the food system entirely. <laughs> My God, we're just, I would like we're gonna start a We're gonna start a consultancy to, you're gonna have to pay us to tell us about, for, to tell wow. you about all our world breaking solutions. You are so amazing Tolu, you, you literally, you know, made us to think so much and you know and she was so encouraging for us and also very quick very good moderator i i, I really enjoyed shalini has been far too generous it was a <laughs> it was a great group i just i just turned up for the ride and i was just i was just i was just holding on to my coat <laughs> to their coattails so it was a great group lots of as, as Janine said, we were just we were just getting going, um, but we got we got uh, to a good place, I think. Nice, wonderful. Great. Came here as well. We also we also uh, finished in time, you know. I think for the first time in my uh, online online career. <laughs> <laughs> online career. All right. Well, this is this is great to hear. Welcome back. And so now we're going to take the time to hear from some of our moderators. Um, and I do see that um, for room seven, since Farah lost connection, there will be another moderator. So I'll make sure to pin your video, but um, let's get started. I'm gonna go a little bit, I know we were rooms one through eight. So I like to switch things up. So 
Um, I'm actually going to uh, start with room five. So Marcus, did you want to take some time to share um, what you all talked about in your group? Yeah, so for sure, Nicole, so glad to do that. I mean, I guess as, as everyone had the same experience, it's extremely tight time frame, especially since you don't know the people, you know, and, but okay, leaving that aside, it was much fun. So we were talking about, um, so the second big topic, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and we chose, we opted for a rather a meta approach. So rather not thinking about what could be improved in terms of vaccination or, you know, specific measures, rather more, how can we ensure better, you know, the nexus between science um, and policy making to make it more effective based on the experiences of, of the pandemic. We identified um, against this background, you know, like scientists and politicians, obviously, as the main stakeholders, they can, of course, then be broken down in terms of the institutional level. When you think about politicians at which level, so it's national governments, but it could also be supranational bodies, obviously, but theoretically also regional level. So we left that open. We didn't have time too much to discuss that. The, the policy option we opted for um, we discussed a few, is really to try to involve scientists more actively directly in the decision-making process, mm -hmm. in the policy-making process, which we identified as the most effective means to go about it. So in the sense of trying to have maybe an established formalized bodies that are actively involved in specifically designed policy areas and that help policymakers finding often, you know, urgent answers to difficult problems. Um, and we discussed a little bit why this might be maybe the best option, but also potential problems of such an approach when you establish direct contacts between scientists and policymakers in terms of expectations, um, dealing with trust and so on. So these were a little bit the discussions that, that, that we had and it was, was really a great group um, I could work with. So I will leave it at that in order not to, to, to use too much of our time. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, the next group I'm going to go to is room four, and I know we merged that with room three, so I believe that's uh, Muhammad and Stucci. Yeah, so in our group, like we discussed, like how we can like the transfer the food system and the mostly the problems that we discussed, like uh, they are like the food safety and security and then global nutrition deficiency and uh, then the about GMOs. So in the most of case, like this, we identify the different stakeholders uh, which can help to transfer this food system. They are like the uh, UN bodies and national and regional uh, uh, bodies and then the national parliaments. And then also the in, they mentioned like our participant, like individual is also responsible for all that, especially when it's come to the food waste. And uh, then we suggested like the different policy approach, like. Uh, how we can transfer the system or improve the uh, system to attain the zero hunger. So they said like we need actually an, an integrative approach similar to like one health system like where uh, they are taking the environmental and animal and human health at same platform. So here is also like host, holistic approach is required. We need to involve the all the institutes or stakeholders dealing with the food security and peace and agriculture so that uh, we can engage, increase more engagement and work out a final plan uh, roadmap to end this thing. And Suthi can give up more insight on it. Right, and just to add on to what Dr. Kasim shared, um, we also discussed about uh, raising awareness, especially uh, by harnessing um, the power of social media, uh, specifically when it comes to uh, food system and food wastage because um, there is a lot of food wastage when it comes to the fast food industries and the consumption of fast food statistically speaking would probably be more within the younger population so harnessing the power of social media to raise awareness um, and also some of the other things that were discussed were um, focusing as uh, Dr. Kassi mentioned on reducing the use of fossil fuel uh, integrated with uh, climate change systems globally and um, having central mechanisms targeting uh, food security, uh, especially nutritional deficiencies um, to uh, kind of bridge the gap in terms of accessibility to proper nutritious food um, in low income 
versus uh, high income countries. Um, so yeah, I think that was what we discussed in the group. Thank you for sharing. That sounds like an excellent discussion. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go back to the COVID topic and um, ask that Jasmine share what was discussed in her room. So take it away. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, yeah, we had a really great uh, discussion as well. We were thinking about trust in science as it pertains to COVID-19. And so we ended up coming up with uh, the problem that we wanted to address being distrust in science, particularly in rural communities and how that can result in vaccine hesitancy. Um, which obviously is a big issue now in terms of COVID-19, but I think even after we've kind of got a grip on COVID-19, it'll continue to be um, an issue as long as vaccines are around. And so thinking about the stakeholders involved, it was really difficult to just come up with two to three. So we had uh, doctors or clinicians as a stakeholder, um, really the entire medical community, so including researchers. We also had politicians as a stakeholder, particularly at kind of the local or the state level. And in the public, and, and thinking about the public, particularly in rural communities, we thought about community or religious leaders, um, as those are often uh, kind of people who have trust within a rural, um, a rural community. And so in thinking about which stakeholders should act on this problem, we thought about this really interesting idea of connecting community or religious leaders with a doctor or a researcher. And so kind of getting two stakeholders together for the price of one. And so the policy option that we decided to go with is developing this longitudinal framework to develop trust between the healthcare community and the public in these rural areas. And the kind of general idea for that is creating a variety of platforms. So platforms to disseminate information from researchers through these community leaders, but then also making sure that that information is fact checked along the way to make sure that it's you know, peer reviewed and that it's um, scientifically sound. Again, pairing community or religious leaders with a nurse or a doctor, and then ensuring, again, kind of speaking to what Marcus had mentioned earlier, ensuring that scientists are working alongside decision makers to make sure that policies that are policies and guidelines that are being rolled out are fact-based and scientifically sound. And then, of course, uh, going back to the great talk we had earlier this morning is encouraging scientists to drop their pride and be more personable. So especially in these rural communities where it's very difficult to, you know, come from out of town and be someone who's trusted, um, kind of encouraging scientists to remove their white coats and approach people with humility and telling them that, you know, I'm here to help you. I'm here to be a resource. So I think that those are all be really great ways to kind of implement this solution. And so the idea is to really link these trusted community members with scientists so that they can disseminate information to the community um, from this uh, trusted person who people will be more likely to listen to. No, oh, that's great. As you were as you were walking through the summary of what your group discussed, the first thing I thought about was drop the pride. <laughs> I'm like, I might put that in my, my Twitter bio now. But, um, yeah, no, I, I think that that's excellent and, and it's great to hear um, what your discussion evolved around. Um, so thank you for sharing and thank you um, all again for volunteering your time. Um, the next person I'm gonna pick on, um, I'm gonna go to group two, um, which is Felix um, that um, was also talking about food systems. So Felix, do you wanna share what you and your group discussed? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in this group, of, of course, we had an interested, very interesting, but unfinished discussion, unfortunately, but we could advance it at least in the, in the uh, key part of the, of the discussion. So I, I would take just two minutes for explaining you what we did. And we have used this uh, collaborative board where we provide ideas and we brainstorm uh, with the different problems, but I, I am now showing you the brainstorm with the stakeholders and then we group you know, all of the idea and we came up with these four big group of stakeholders for this particular problem of unsustainable production system. And then we choose, or we thought that the key stakeholder for solving this problem are policymakers, of regulatory agencies, government, and so on. Uh, like we stated here, and we discuss about the policy options, and we provide a very interesting idea from uh, supporting small farmers to promote research and development or, or 
or to uh, incentivize the, um, uh, diversifying crops and so on. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, have time to uh, go further with the discussion, but this is something that uh, we could work in later. And, and that's it, so thank you. Yes, thank you for sharing it. And, and I hope you all took the time to also exchange contact information to remain in touch and, and maybe some of these discussions certainly can continue even uh, via email and over chats. Um, so next I'm going to go to uh, Pradeep's group, um, which is also was focused on COVID. So um, please share what you all were able to talk about. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, it was an amazing group and we, we started with so many things uh, such as, um, but most of our group was a vaccine. Okay, so in vaccine, and it, we, we zeroed it down to vaccine equity in excess. And then when we were discussing vaccine equity in excess, then uh, we further discussed like, okay, we cannot go into do two of these very, very uh, separate topics. And we then decided to go with vaccine equity at the global level. And then we found uh, several stakeholders and we zeroed down to political administration uh, up the level and as well as the pharma industry. And then up, out of these two, we went forward with the political administration and how we can um, provide incentives and subsidies and how patents and manufacturing can work all together, commercial licensing. And, and the biggest, uh, the talking point that comes out, came out of the discussion was multilateral collaboration and cooperation between the countries as well as uh, WTO countries discussion, even uh, philanthropy came into, uh, came into the discussion. And we then we, we stuck to multilateral cooperation and collaboration. Right? So it was an amazing, like we didn't even know 45 minutes and <laughs> we, managed to, we managed to do something. So we, okay, we left everything. Then we carried on with multilateral cooperation and collaboration. That was, that was a solution that we chose among all other things. And we decided that how, why uh, why did we choose this is because of, so uh, one of the, the participants mentioned that it's like a waterfall. So everything happens on the top and it trickles down or filters down to, to different uh, aspects. So if we can uh, sort it out on the top, it will be much better. And the trade, travel, economy, and these can be less uh, affect, being affected by the COVID-19. And these all can, play a part together. Rather than having just big tax inequity, we, everything ex, uh, affects us, the variants emerging in various uh, areas of the world, okay? So if we don't have vaccine equity, then these variants will keep on emerging. And, and the, so multilateral cooperation and collaboration becomes very big. And how will we, you implement this solution? So we have two uh, short, uh, short acting goals and long acting. So in short acting, it's like uh, you can use the, you can tap on the existing global systems, for example, TB, malaria, supply chains, uh, where there is, a, there is already inequity uh, sorted out. And we have long-term treaties, incentives, and even penalties for, who, uh, for, for countries who are not uh, following, the, following the trend or, or the norm. So that's how we, we came to the conclusions. Uh, I, but it was a very nice discussion. And, we, luckily, we, we got to the last point. Uh, I think we 50, 50 seconds left, so we had uh, we had uh, everything sorted in that time. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for sharing. Um, the next group I'm going to go to is uh, the last food systems group, I believe, Tallulah. Yes. So, here's what we did. So we mapped out when we were brainstorming what the key problems were. And that's, those are the smaller post-its. And they were, essentially, we saw that they were already grouped into problems related to farming, problems related to processing, problems related to behavior in terms of diet and, and what outcomes those, those um, generate. So farming related to fertilizer, the kind of fertilizer used that's harmful to the environment and potentially also health as well as uh, obesogenic issues. And um, from a processing perspective, lack of, lack of facilities period to process and resulting in food waste, um, and also um, an ability, inability for farmers to get their foods out to, um, to, um, to sell. 
And then there were behaviors and that were related to exposure, what people wanted to eat or they could afford to eat. So we then mapped out, we had a bit of a brainstorm in terms of the key actors, which I won't focus on, but two things. We actually flipped, we discussed the policy options first, and then we discussed the um, stakeholders because we kind of felt that it was, was better. So in terms of policy options, we didn't go down to whittling, but we say there were three policy options. One focused on farmers to support production, distribution of fresh produce and reduce harm to the environment. One to, second to reduce food waste and whilst preserving that uh, nutritional value, and third to promote the healthy food healthy food sovereignty in communities. So when we then, you know, one is around farm to fork kind of approach and and, uh, and education farmers around fertilizer use. The other is thinking about how do you in safely preserve shelf life and conserve nutritional value and support processing and marketing related to advertising of unhealthy um, foods, uh, increasing access to healthy foods and reducing an access, um, access to unhealthy foods. So these then we then mapped which stakeholders we thought should act on those key problems. So we thought for the sustainable farming policy should be led by the Ministry of Agriculture um, and with, with participation from these other ministries, um, consumer authority transportation, because that was identified as a key issue in terms of getting foods to, to um, processes. And then in terms of reducing food waste, we thought the Food Standard Authority and, and um, in India, there was a Ministry of Food Processing, which we thought they should take the lead, but important for the Health Ministry and Finance to be involved in that. And lastly, for the policies to promote food sovereignty in, in involving the urban planning, because they zone and they actually determine what food is sold in the area, the industry, including retail and importantly, community advocacy groups. So that's as far as we got um, with that. Thank you for sharing. Um, it seems like lots of great, great ideas there. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, um, we'll have, is it NC? Please correct me if I'm wrong, um, sharing what Group 7 talked about during their discussion on COVID. Yeah, hi everybody. No, my name is Korek, but the point is I didn't want to be the moderator of the this group, but unfortunately I lost the connection sometimes and we didn't even have the access to the document what we are going to discuss, but we just made it in a random way. But I hope I can explain what we have done regarding the COVID and we can hope to solve this problem for the next pandemic. So of course, we, we are agree with the, with the Marcus that, that we really need to have the communications, deep communication with different parts of the society, communication with the policymakers and also with the scientists and also connection with the people in regard in the case of the pandemic. And also we realize that in the, in the countries that also, for example, in the continents of the Europe, when the policymakers have a strong relation between each other, they can make the better decisions in general because they said that, okay, we have the same rule more or less for all the countries. And also the lockdowns are the same, the uh, closing the borders were more or less the same. Even in the case of the uh, providing the vaccine for the Europe, they, they made it in a general form that in any country does not buy the vaccine for its own. And they said, okay, that, that the population of the Europe is that amount. So we are going to prepare the vaccine for all the Europe. So then we realized that when there is a really deep policy and also really strong relations between the countries all around that continent. They make better decisions for all the society because they already have established a better economical situation and also the other rules are more or less the same. So they, they make better. So it seems that we have lack of these uh, policy connections even between the politicians regarding the pandemic issues. We didn't see these connections in, for example, in the, in the Latin American countries or other parts of the parts of the globe regarding this pandemic issue. So the connection even between the politicians is really, really important to have the same decision and also asking the really different scientists from all around the, around the society. So we also talk, talked about the trust in science. Of course, it's one of the main issues that for trust in science, uh, if, if the scientists really believe on what they are talking about, so they should insist that they are right. But sometimes they really give up too soon. So I say that, okay, considering the politicians as I'm sorry, as a foolish people, they don't trust on them. So they don't really insist that what I am saying is going to have a really economical effect also in the future. I think we should talk with the sign with the politician with their own languages, okay? If they don't uh, understand the re results of the scientific uh, research, maybe we can say, okay, if you don't follow that, 
it's going to affect the economy of the society. So then they will, they will listen to you more. And then if we since this one, and they didn't listen to us and they see the effect and the results of the not listening, but if we insist maybe next time, they will approach to say that what is your uh, scientific research results and then we can share them with them. So, so we, should, we should not give up as a scientist to, to make these connections. And, uh, and also we know that if the government and if any society has a really good connection within own people, in the case of the pandemic, that so that the people can trust the science to the, to the politicians more. So if the country is more democratic, of course the connections and the trust is much is much deeper and much better and then in that society the, the people believe that the politicians also trust to the to the scientists and of course the results of the research of the scientists is going to affect their life in a really good way so we really need, need to make the problem of the pandemic is related to trust in any in any level and also from the beginning of the pandemic we realized that even most of the countries they don't trust so the results of the scientists that happens in the in the origin of in the country of the origin that the pandemic is started so nobody really believed that something as as a pandemic is going to start so one of the main issues as the stakeholders we talked about is about, is about the who we realized that okay even most of the countries they don't believe in who so then we really need a strong organizations and if something happens in future that they could guide and also the people all around the world trust what they are saying and also we could react in a really sooner way. So the lack of the stakeholders like the organizations much powerful than the WHO is really clear in, in the case of the pandemic. So we should make it stronger for not to have the same problem in, in future. That was, I think, all that we talked about that. If I miss something, sorry. No, that was great. Thank you for sharing what you all talked about in the group. And we're really looking forward to reviewing what you all discussed um, by taking a look at the, the documents that were sent around to the moderators. Um, and just to give some insight to all the participants. Um, so first, I want to thank all the moderators once again, really thankful for you volunteering your time, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening. Um, we really are thankful for you being here today. Um, and to let all the participants know, um, tomorrow's session will discuss, uh, will be a more in-depth discussion um, in breakout rooms with reviewers that will provide some feedback on some of the outlines that you uh, created today. And so you'll be able to ask more questions about um, your topics and how a memo should be structured with some, ex with some um, folks who have expertise in these areas in these science policy topics. So thank you again, and, and thank you all for participating. Um, and we will see you all back tomorrow at 1400 Coordinated Universal Time, or if you are where I am on the East Coast of the United States, 10 a.m. So whatever, uh, whatever conversion works best for you, um, we will see you all tomorrow and thank you all again for participating. Thank you moderators for leading these really great discussions. We're really grateful for having you all here today um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. So see you tomorrow, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye to all. Bye. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. All right. So, um, Hi, everybody. Welcome to day two of our science policy memo writing workshop organized by the Journal of Science Policy and Governance in collaboration with the Global Young Academy. Today, we'll continue conversations in breakout rooms on topics that you worked on yesterday. You'll get a chance to interact with the reviewers um, who you see on the screen. They'll also be moderating the rooms. And then we also have a few moderators from yesterday's who came back uh, who will be really helpful for our discussion as well. So room one will be moderated by Shaheen Timol, focusing on fo uh, food systems. Uh, two will be Vindushi, also food systems. Three will be Stefan with COVID related topics. And four will be Gada, also COVID related topics. And we've combined a couple of the rooms together, uh, which I think should work pretty well with the number of folks here. Um, so you may be reviewing more than one document, but hopefully it will be a nice um, discussion all together. 
Um, so I want to just share again the documents for the moderators, for the breakouts and the reviewers. Um, we've asked them to give comments in the Google Docs. And then um, there's also a rubric that you can review and go through. <clears throat> <clears throat> Moderators will be able to share their screen, uh, discuss comments with you, as well as the scores on there. Um, so that's really all I have in terms of intro. Um, since we'll be working in groups, I wanted to just give them a chance to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their expertise, uh, if they have any um, takeaways from the review process, and then we'll be setting up the the breakouts in the meantime. Um, this is for the moderators. Um, if you can go through this list here, so your name, your position, if you wanna talk about your role with GYA, uh, a little bit about your expertise and background. If you have one takeaway from the review process, is there something that you learned that you think would be useful for the group to know while you are reading and then, um, something that you think would be important to take away from today, which we'll also review when we come back. Um, and they'll ask you to turn on your video as well when you're talking. Um, I think most of you are on. If you got it, if you can turn on your video as well. Um, and we'll go through, through the list. Um, since I will be working in the background, I'll ask you to just, um, start with the intro and then pass it on to the next person. So we'll go through the, the whole group. So I won't be stopping you, you can just pass on. Um, so let me start with uh, Shaheen. Okay. Hello everyone, um, good evening. So I'm Shaheen Mutala Timol from uh, the island of Mauritius. I work for the Higher Education Commission, which is the regulatory body for higher education education uh, in Mauritius. I head the uh, division of the regulatory affairs and accreditation. So basically, we look after all higher education institutions, accredit their program, register higher education institutions. So I do have some experience in uh, working on policy development and policy planning together with the Ministry of Education. I also had the opportunity with the Global Young Academy to follow a few workshops on uh, policy writing. Uh, and uh, I have to say that there are two different types of policies that I'm involved in. Some are institutional policies and then there are countrywide policies. So uh, I had two documents to review. And from my understanding, uh, there was a process yesterday where people put forward one item that they wanted to discuss for their policies. And uh, I think that I will discuss this in more detail when I get into my group. So thank you. Um, if she maybe, yeah, uh, Adriana? Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll introduce myself, uh, Vidushini again, uh, from Mauritius as well. Um, I have been a GYA member from 2012 to 2017. And currently I'm an associate professor at the University of Mauritius. More particularly, I'm based in the Center for Biomedical and Biomaterial Research. So um, I'm a scientist, a hardcore scientist, a research scientist, um, but I have, uh, and I have a very strong interest in, in policy writing. It's because I work in public health in the prevention of cancer and for the research to reach the, the government, the science advisors, um, uh, I think I need to, I, I, I should uh, be involved in, in policy writing. Um, so um, that's my, my background basically, and I was really happy to see the, um, the, the, your contribution. I can see that there was a, a very big brainstorming that, that uh, happened yesterday. And maybe one takeaway message that I um, 
that I would say is that whenever we recommend something or whether, whenever we are concluding on a particular policy, I think we need to prioritize evidence um, that will support our recommendation. And I think this was a little bit missing, maybe due to time, to, to the time that you had, et cetera, but we can discuss it more in depth when we will be in our breakout session. Thank you. So I'll pass on to Reda. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Reda Basuni. I have been uh, at the Global Young Academy uh, from 2013 till 2018, and I have been working uh, on the EC for, uh, three, for two years. And um, I have been also leading uh, uh, the uh, Women in Science Working Group uh, for three years at the same uh, range of time. So, uh, um, and uh, I'm actually, uh, from, a, from a professional point of view, I'm a professor of chemistry and uh, I, um, uh, I um, uh, chair the uh, chemistry department at the Faculty of Engineering at Shams University in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, and I have been working uh, for more than 10 years uh, with the Ministry uh, of Higher Education and Scientific Research, uh, coordinating collaborations uh, on an international level. Uh, so I have been dealing with the policy uh, makers and uh, decision uh, takers uh, for quite some time. Uh, uh, and currently I'm also involved with the Supreme Council of Universities uh, uh, at, here in Egypt, uh, uh, putting policies together uh, on a um, uh, higher educational uh, level. And uh, um, I'm also a project manager uh, there at the Supreme Council of University as a joint appointment to my actual position. Uh, so this was uh, my background. Uh, uh, I had uh, the pleasure to uh, look into some of the sessions yesterday and uh, I have been involved in one of these uh, breakout sessions. And uh, uh, my takeaway is actually when I also reviewed uh, uh, room seven and eight uh, that uh, for, for it's, it's nice to discuss, it's very nice to discuss and brainstorm, but in the end, what really counts is that you need to put on paper the things that you are discussing to, to go ahead with some really uh, good points that can be uh, doable and uh, that you can execute. So ideas are great, but execution is better. Thank you. Stefan? Yes, I unmuted myself. So my name is Stefan Kohler. Um, I co-lead the uh, Global Health Working Group in the Global Young Academy. And I'm uh, also a research associate at the Heidelberg Institute of Global Health at Heidelberg uh, University. Um, in my research, I often collaborate with um, regional governments, um, NGOs, or international organizations. So um, it's an interesting field of research, which may contrast from the um, everyday life of other researchers, because um, I'm really working in the sphere of interdisciplinary work and also relating often to the implementers already, which has its challenges and very rewarding sides. Um, yeah, so my personal background is in population health and health uh, service um, provision, also in looking into cost and cost effectiveness of services, which often has a direct political uh, relevance. And um, what I um, sort of observed yesterday echoes very much with what Geda um, summarized. Um, reviewing the um, impressive sort of drafts which came out of these uh, short brainstorming sessions, I put myself in the shoes of a decision maker and what I was looking for was basically um, evidence and advice upon which I could directly act upon if I wanted to. So specific points that in a way come from the discussion and that sort of paired with a discussion of risks and uncertainty and possible alternatives. And so um, what I would like to sort of have as a takeaway from today's session is um, yeah, maybe the awareness in, in policy briefs to focus on actionable implications of our own research um, 
and also including outcomes that can be measured after say maybe five, two to five years, even if long-term recommendations are given. And I look forward, I think, to the time we have to discuss this further in the breakout rooms. Great. Great. So there everyone go. Okay. Sounds like that. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Just back here. Great. So there are people who joined uh, in the meantime. I was able to assign a few a few folks. Um, it may take a few more minutes, but we can go ahead and start and then we'll um, continue assigning. So I don't want you to be waiting. Um, so in the documents, um, as I mentioned, there will be um, comments to review moderators. You can share your screen to go through the uh, comments with um, participants. Uh, please review the rubric as well. That's helpful for them to see sort of where they stand. And um, for participants, please take advantage of uh, the expertise you have here today. Uh, like I mentioned, folks from yesterday have also come back and uh, there's a lot of great expertise here for you all to discuss about policy topics or writing or both. Uh, I'm excited for the discussions that you can have. So um, we have, I believe, about 40 minutes or so, uh, may extend a little bit more, um, but I would like to then just have um, a little bit of recap when we're coming back. So again, uh, as yesterday, I'll ask the moderators to um, give a couple of takeaways from your room. Again, general things that you think would be useful for the group to know about policy writing. And then we'll conclude after that. So most of today will be just more discussions. Um, I don't have much more to say other than uh, if there are any questions, I'll wait a, wait a minute to see if anybody has any questions right now. Great. Okay, um, so I will go ahead and open the rooms with the folks who are here and then assign the rest of you. So maybe a few minutes delay just to, um, just to get everybody in. And I'll be in the main room if there's any issues. Okay, coming back to plenary. Great. Uh, yeah, let me pin you guys again. Okay. Okay. Are we all here? Let me see. Is Fiduci? Just one second. Hmm. 
I don't know. I don't know what the issue is here. Oh, there we go. All right, turn on to this as well. Should be good. So, all right, well, hope you had a good discussion, uh, gained some knowledge on writing and the policy topics that you discussed. Um, I will ask the moderators to give a, a couple of takeaways. While we do that, I just wanna remind you of our um, GSBG channels that I brought, brought up yesterday where you can follow us. Uh, let me just paste that in here, as well as our newsletter. Um, I mentioned the course that we're doing with UC Irvine. So the registration closes June 1st. Um, also, we'll share that as well so anyone can sign up. And then finally, the YouTube channel that um, we'll post this recording, as well as other trainings that we've done. So I also encourage you to subscribe to that and you can um, copy these over as we're talking or look them up. Um, so let's start with um, room one. Shaheen, if you can give us a couple of takeaways and then we'll also go through um, the folks who were here yesterday in case you have anything to add. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So it was a lively discussion. We had a lot of questions on policy writing. Um, I introduced uh, uh, with uh, that it is important when we are writing a policy to have a context in place so that we can introduce our problem. This is very important. And I think that this is something that was not reflected in the document that we received yesterday. The problems were there. So everyone understand that there are issues that we want to solve, but we have to put that in a context, whether it's localized, it's global, uh, and uh, this has to be identified. And the stakeholders who are impacted by the issue and who can address this issue. This was uh, in all policy document. I think the all participants got that right. But we have, whenever we are writing a policy, we have to always keep our audience in mind. So our narrative should be directed to them. And this was discussed. What is the language that we have to use? Uh, should we uh, use simple uh, words? Should we be using like, uh, like terminologies that are associated with our expertise? So we discussed that it is best to use a simple narrative that uh, uh, and to focus uh, on the issue and not to dilute our policy. So always to provide evidence for the issue that we want to address. And uh, usually a policy is a short document and we can add all the evidence in some cases as annexes to that document so that we keep focus, we are focused in our policy document. So um, it is also important to understand that in the policy, we need to, to know what is the change that we want to bring with this document, what are the results that we think are going uh, to be there, and the outcome, and how this can be implemented. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, is it uh, how can we measure that? So if we have a research we have done in a small scale, can, we, can this also be scalable, generalized to other communities? So this could be included in the policy memo. Uh, one thing that we discuss is also when we are writing a policy, uh, there, there was something that I learned when I did a workshop once is that there are five W's and one H that we need to address. So these were the what, so what is the context? What is the problem? Where is this problem? Why is this a problem? Because it might not be a problem to everyone. It might just be my problem. So uh, is it worth writing a policy about that? Who are the people involved? Um, when can I resolve, uh, resolve this issue? And how do I do that? So the how is also very important. So you have to propose a solution and how you're going to implement that. And uh, I think this, we have to take all these into consideration when we are writing our policy uh, 
a memo or policy document. And I think Felix mentioned that uh, for a policy document, usually it's 2000 words. So it really it's important to keep it concise, but also that it should be based on evidence, whatever we are working on. So uh, this is in a nutshell what we discussed. Very helpful, thanks for that. Uh, really good general points, I think, for everyone to take away. Uh, Felix, did you have anything to add since you're in that room? No, that's perfect. Shaheen has covered everything, yeah. Great, thanks. Let's move on to Vidushi. Yeah, thank you. So I think um, a lot of what um, Shaheen just said was uh, mentioned in our session as well. And um, I got some help by the moderator, Mohammed. It was uh, really good to have him because yesterday he was involved in, in the session. So I think um, what I also observed was that uh, there was a lot of information, a lot of brainstorming, as I said in, uh, in my introductory uh, remark. And I think whenever we are thinking of um, identifying a problem, we have to focus on one problem. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think that was, um, we did have a, a long discussion on that. If the problem is not identified correctly, so any solution that we are going to propose will, I, I mean, will not work. Uh, so I think uh, this is what we lengthily discussed about. And then the second thing was, um, because uh, due to lack of time, I think uh, the, the action, the solution proposed was not very uh, clear. And also since the, the problem was not clearly identified, so the, 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 the action was not, I mean, the solution was not uh, very focused. So I think we need very, uh, we have to focus on actionable solutions and uh, which is, uh, um, uh, backed by uh, some kind of support, uh, which is backed by evidence, which will support the recommendations. And of course, any policy has to be written in a very simple language. So we also touch base on these things, but the three main things that we, we discussed lengthily was the problem, which has to be focused, the solution, a very actionable solution, which is uh, uh, backed by some evidence that, that will support the, the, the solution. Great, great points. Thank you. Uh, Muhammad, did you have anything to add from both days? Yeah, so as the Sudeshi mentioned, like we also discussed about like uh, until we will not have a like clear idea about the problems, we cannot give the comments and then our whatever we are writing must be like very concise and backed by the data and then we need to use the layman approach because the politicians, they are not that much technical and they don't have the time to read the lengthy things so when we are writing a policy memo it must be like very precise and like to the point great point thanks great okay so let's move on to stefan you're still muted how are discussions echo uh yeah, with points already mentioned, um, to summarize, like we felt that prioritizing information and language that enables someone to take a decision is really sort of key for the policy memo. And really, I think Vidushi said it, um, focusing on one problem um, and putting that possibly in context and also referencing it to a larger picture can be helpful, but it's in a way really good to yeah, have the specific problem statement and a solution to that. Um, we also discussed that yeah, sometimes we have cases where policy advice is welcome, while we have other contexts where policy advice uh, from scientists is, is not heard or, um, yeah, how to overcome that. And um, yeah, related to that, how scientists could possibly gain yeah, trust by the decision makers. And uh, one way forward could be also to have sufficient information in the uh, 
policy brief that um, allows to assess the decision maker the, the expertise of the person giving the background, right? It needs to be concise, but by maybe reformulating the problem in own words clearly and sort of providing concise sources for evidence or appendices which was set for further reading, that can help in a way yeah, backing up the expertise uh, on or the, the evidence on which a decision is based. And a final thought was to maybe also give choice by formulating uh, alternative courses of actions, including what could be outcomes um, if, for instance, politics would not act now and leave the status quo. Whatever we do leads to different results and maybe sort of just also concisely portraying possible outcomes under different decisions um, yeah, might enable a decision maker to take a course of action. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, I really like how you took that a little further into sort of the actionable part of this and bringing it back to the, the trust question that we're working on here. So very helpful. Um, Marcus or NC, I think you guys are both on this topic. Do either of you have anything else? Not from my side. So I think Stefan nicely summed up uh, our today's discussion. So nothing from my side. I don't have any comments. It was really clear. Thank you, Stefan. Great. Okay. And then let's go to Gada. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, I really actually enjoyed very much uh, the uh, the discussion because uh, uh, we were the two groups uh, together the, for the rooms seven and eight of yesterday. And I was lucky uh, that uh, one group re re did really, really well. And uh, so I took uh, uh, one yeah, I mean, point by point uh, the uh, the topics uh, like the questions and we went through and we discussed about uh, the tone for example of uh, how uh, you would address uh, policy makers and uh, um, so many many aspects of uh, write-up and uh, what what kind of uh, things that would be offensive for a policy maker or what can be uh, uh, really nice uh, to have and uh, what can be capturing for the policy makers um, and uh, we went through the uh, the uh, phrasing of the, uh, the 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 problem and the solution as well. Uh, the second group was uh, didn't have time uh, yesterday to phrase the the solution in a uh, in a detailed manner. So uh, I took the the other groups. Uh, um, uh, points and uh, we discussed uh, in details how uh, we would write uh, this kind of solution and um, uh, I think um, uh, the discussions because I uh, involved both groups in both uh, 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 write-ups uh, um, so even we came up with new ideas that were, were not really there uh, yesterday and uh, uh, so I think it was also a, a nice exercise for the two, two groups uh, for me as well. I learned a lot. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Can you give us examples for the tone? And if either of you want to address that. Okay, I will. Um, I can show you. Uh, the, I, I will just take out the, the phrase uh, from the <laughs> from the, the document. Uh, just give me a few seconds. You can just go ahead with moderating until I get the the thing that uh, was really offensive. Uh, yeah, Stefan, did you have a response to that? Yeah. No, I could like bring in another thought while uh, Gaida is looking up the phrase. Um, it was an interesting sort of observation reflecting about our process what we did um, I felt it's a quite fruitful process the uh, structured discussion with moderators summing uh, key points giving that to a reviewer and meeting again I mean when it comes to the content uh, groups worked on it's it's I mean it's just kicking off a question but in a way in a very short and effective time um, and 
and that was nice to see. And I think it's different from my day-to-day -day life and possibly different from the experience of most colleagues uh, joining us today. Um, it's an sort of output-oriented uh, process, like the groups worked under great time pressure and captured all points yesterday. So they, I think, needed to compromise. And I find it very difficult often in my writing to compromise. And so it's a slow and lengthy process. So, I mean, obviously, um, some questions were just started and, and, and answers were put in on a general level, but the documents were filled out. And the moderators, I think, who consolidated that um, presented me with a document which gave me an opportunity to give structured feedback which was also really nicely facilitated through the like, uh, um, feedback form you provided. Um, so I feel in a way that's a, a good process in itself to give feedback from such a diverse group. And that in a way brings me to another comment and a question for later. So the comment is that something which is really special and particular about the group of people today is I think the diversity we have in terms of disciplines and in terms of uh, yeah, global uh, scope. And that's a very uh, unique expertise that we have a discussion uh, on one topic in this diverse group. And um, it's challenging to make that output oriented. Um, so I think this process can help facility uh, can help facilitate uh, these discussions. And that would bring me to a question which I'm sure you are going to address. Uh, a couple of participants asked, how could that possibly be taken forward what we started? But feel free also to postpone the question to later. This was using an opportunity to, to provide further feedback by Gerda I was looking up the statement. Yeah. So yeah. The would be like trust in science in COVID-19 pandemics. Scientists should insist that they are right and what they work on should be important for the economy. So this is something that would be very offensive to a policymaker. Yeah, so I think maybe if you phrase it as this is sort of like the evidence that the scientists bring to the table, I guess depends how you frame that. But yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing up that point. So this is sort of um, the end of we're out of time anyway, so I can sort of wrap up with this thought, uh, the question that you asked. Um, we, you know, as has been said both days, uh, these workshops are pretty short. Uh, we can only do so much time, but open to other um, sort of structures, but it sounds like the structure works well. Um, this is really meant to just give you a little bit of a taste of what it's like to write memos, you know, work through the outlines you heard from the speaker yesterday. And so we're hoping that you will continue this. Uh, we encourage you to submit to the journal. Um, I'll share our website again, uh, where you can find examples of memos as well, like we discussed, you know, 2000 words and so on. Um, we will also share the documents out, uh, so if you'd like to continue working with the group, uh, you know, we encourage you to use this as a sort of primer to continue writing and uh, you can feel free to, to meet with your group and we hope that you'll, you'll submit uh, and glad to hear this was helpful. Um, so now I just, uh, in closing, just like to thank our partners at the Global Young Academy and give Felix a chance to say a few last words. Thank you, Adriana. And um, well, thank you so much to all the reviewers. I think I, I have enjoyed so, so much the session this afternoon, my afternoon. Um, well, and, and that's it. I just wanted to remind you all that this coming week, uh, we are, um, there will be our annual conference in the Global Young Academy. So I will, I will, put in the chat the link for the registration to the public conference as it would be on Wednesday. So, such that you could check uh, participants, you could check the agenda and the topics that we are going to address. On the other hand, please subscribe to the newsletter again of the GYA such that you will be updated of all our activities. Uh, 
And that's it. Thank you again to the reviewers, to the moderators yesterday, to all the participants. And well, we are going to contact you all to share the document and begin to plan uh, the further steps with the work that we have done during this weekend because it is so, 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 so valued that it would be a shame that it, it would remain in Google Drive instead of uh, in the journal. Yeah, so please, thank you all. Please continue working. Yeah, just to echo that, thanks everybody who volunteered to moderate, participate, uh, review, and all of you all who came back for day two, really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Hopefully this was beneficial to everybody. Uh, and like I said, we encourage you to continue working on these and feel free to reach out to us if we can be of any more help to you. And hope you have great, something extremely important. Please turn on your cam to take a picture, the group picture. <laughs> Please come on everybody, don't be shy. Okay. Uh, it will be two screen captures. This is the first one. That way they could cover everybody. And okay, and another one. Okay, here I go. That's it. Thank you so much. Oh, very nice. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye.